Hi guys and welcome to chapter 4. Chapter 4 mainly dives into some of the nuances within community ecology. That's going to be the relationships between different species within a community. This is probably my favorite chapter out of all the chapters in this uh, course. And anyway, today we're going to be diving into species interactions. Let's take a look. Now the first interaction that we're going to go over today is going to be that of competition. And competition is when multiple organisms seek the same types of natural resources. Now, different resources for a organism can be a variety of different things. It can be things like food, water, or space, maybe shelter or habitat. Uh, things like mates, if males are going to be competing for the right to mate with a female in order to pass their genes along and reproduce. And if you are plants, uh, maybe sunlight. Competition for sunlight within a dense forest is going to be a resource that you're going to be trying to compete for. Now, we should note here that in the instance of competition, both competitors are negatively affected. It's going to negatively affect both both organisms competing here because otherwise, if they didn't ha have to compete, they wouldn't have to exert a certain amount of energy or effort in order to gain those resources. The resources could be acquired more easily. So when organisms have to compete, both are going to expend uh, extra energy in order to compete with one another, and it's going to negatively affect those organisms. Now, there are two types of competition that we're going to dive in and look at here, and that's going to be the competition within organisms of the same species and organisms from different species. So the first is going to be intra-specific competition, and that's going to be competition between members of these same species. This is going to occur in higher population density, something that we talked about at the end of chapter three. Remember that higher population densities of a single species is going to increase the competition for resources. That is exactly Exactly what is going on here and this has this is a density dependent uh, limiting factor just again bringing back bringing you back to what we talked about in the at the end of chapter 3 when the population gets high enough all of a sudden resources become increasingly scarce and organisms in the same species are going to compete with one another in order to gain access to those resources and in this case we have an example of two stags competing with each other in order to gain the right to mate with a given female now again because because this is a density dependent limiting factor, instances of interest specific competition tend to have an inhibiting effect on population growth. One of the reasons, again, that populations kind of taper off, remember that we had that, that graph that was an S shaped curve. One of the reasons that organisms begin to taper off as they get too, as their populations get too big, is because of interest specific competition. They're now competing with other members of the same, of the same species in order to gain resources. Now, things get a little different when we talk about inter-specific comp uh, competition. Inter-specific competition is competition between members of two different species. So, intra, T-R-A, that's going to be same species. Inter, T-E-R, that's going to be different species. And inter-specific competition strongly affects community composition of a given ecosystem. And basically, when two different species are competing with one another, it can lead to two different things. Uh, either it can lead to something called competitive exclusion, where one species completely outcompetes the other and basically kicks it out of the, uh, the entire ecosystem, or you can see something called resource partitioning. When you think of resource partitioning, think of it as being sort of a compromise between two different members of two different species. Basically, what's going to happen here is that to avoid competition, some species uh, specialize to access very specific reservoirs of resources and other organisms that were, were again, competing for the same resource, uh, specialize to compete for other uh, specific reserves of that given resource. So, for example, we have two different ecosystems and communities where different species have partitioned their resources. Uh, in the bottom example on the bottom uh, left hand side of your uh, screen, you, sh you can see how different uh, shorebirds have adapted to have different sized beaks and necks in order to compete for uh, mollusks in the beach or in the shoreline that are at different water depths. So the flamingo can go way down in very deep water and then things like plovers have adapted to scoop up little uh, periwinkles right on the shoreline. So so this is a great example of a resource partitioning. The resource being the uh, mollusks in the beach and the resource partitioning being specializing to look and access different reservoirs of these mollusks at the beach in different areas in the beach, so different depths of water. Similarly, on the right-hand side of your screen over here, you can see that different
different birds looking for eating insects within trees have adapted to eating the different insects in different trees in different ways. They've specialized to get very good at getting resources in specific reserves. It's the same resource no matter what they're what you're looking at, but they're going to be in specific pockets and getting that resource in specific ways. So again, when you think of resource partitioning, think of it as a compromise between species so that everyone can get access to different facets of that resource. Now the next interaction that we're going to talk about is predation. And predation is the process by which one individual, a predator of one species, captures and kills and then and then eats or consumes another individual from a different species, which is going to be your prey. Now, in the species interaction of predation, there is a clear uh, organism that benefits, that's going to be a predator, and a an organism which clearly is negatively affected, that's going to be your prey. A great example is going to be the grizzly bear eating a salmon over here on the right-hand side of your screen. Now, predation affects community dynamics within the ecosystems with which they take place. So they, they alter or they govern the structure of food webs, something we'll talk about in the next uh, lecture. They're going to dictate community composition by choosing which prey they like to eat. They control the abundances of that prey within the ecosystem, and they affect the populations of that prey organism within the ecosystem. So they do have a very significant effect on the community, uh, the community composition of the ecosystems that they are in. Now, in addition, uh, they also drive population dynamics. So I touched on that just a second ago, but just to go into it a little bit deeper, there are these patterns of boom and busts within predator and prey uh, within different ecosystems. A great example of this is going to be the lynx and the snowshoe hare over on the right hand, bottom right hand side of your graph. Look at how whenever the hare uh, rises in population, there's a little bit of a lag, but the lynx also rises in population as well. Once all of those hares have been consumed, now there's going to be a steep competition for resources and the lynx population goes back down again. And so it, whenever the hares begin to get too far out of control in their population growth, the lynxes will compensate for that by also increasing their populations and then bring the hares population back down to something more manageable. If you recall from chapter two, this is a great example of a negative feedback loop. There's something that pushes the system, the ecosystem off balance, and then there is a, uh, there is a response that will eventually bring that system back to equilibrium. In this case, the uh, perturbation, the thing that moved the ecosystem out of whack, is an explosion in growth in the hair, and the negative feedback loop system is going to be the lynx's population increasing in size to compensate and bring the system back to normal by lowering those uh, hair population sizes. Now, in addition, this also drives natural selection. When we look at predation, there's a bit of an evolutionary arms race. Uh, basically, prey respond to pressures from predation by developing very elaborate defenses or evolving uh, very elaborate defenses, such as camouflage, which you can see over here on the top right-hand side of your screen with this leaf tree, tree leaf gecko, which looks just like a dead leaf. They can get warning coloration, so they can get become poisonous, meaning like the for example, like the poison dart frog in uh, the Amazon Valley, or the Amazon rainforest, it has become poisonous to eat, and then it has de also developed warning coloration to warn predators that uh, that basically say, "Hey, if you eat me, I'm going to kill you," and it deters predators from eating those organisms. And then finally, something called mimicry. Uh, mimicry is when an organism basically develops warning coloration to look poisonous, but isn't actually poisonous. So on the bottom right-hand side of your screen, you can see another example of a frog that also looks like it has warning coloration, but it's not actually poisonous. So it's kind of taking advantage of uh, other organisms that have warning coloration and are dangerous or are poisonous and sort of piggybacking off of that because this way it doesn't have to spend the energy and the resources to create its own poison. It can just look like something that's poisonous. Now, this evolutionary arms race also goes both ways. When you look below on your screen, you can see an owl that has basically adopted camouflage to blend into its environment. So this is where the arms race takes place. The prey will evolve a useful adaptation and then the predators will evolve a useful adaptation to compensate. 
right? So they're constantly trying to one-up each other. Now, the next interaction we're going to talk about is something called parasitism. And parasitism is a relationship where one organism, the parasite, depends on another organism, the host, at the expense of that host organism. So a parasite harms but doesn't actually kill its uh, host because it needs to live there. And so in the species interaction of parasitism, the parasite benefits by getting a home as well as resources, and the host loses because the host is losing resources to the parasite, and it makes it harder for that host organism to survive. A great example of parasitism that you might be familiar with is that of uh, tapeworms, which live inside of the host. They live in the gut and eat the uh, some of the food that a uh, host organism consumes itself. And then there are parasites which live on a uh, host, such as ticks, which suck blood from the host in order to gain those resources for reproduction. And finally, over on the right-hand side of your screen here, you have an example of one of these isopods, these little creepy crawly bugs that actually get into a fish's mouth, eat out the fish's tongue, and then pretend to be the tongue for the rest of the organism's lifespan. So this is another example of a parasite and kind of a creepy one at that. Now, herbivory is some one type of interaction that you're probably familiar with, similar to predation. And herbivory is when animals feed on the tissues of plants. Uh, this can be a, actually a form of predation or parasitism, depending on whether or not the animal outright kills the host or just harms it. However, because it is an interaction with animals and plants, this is uh, treated as a different type of species interaction from that of predation and parasitism. Now, uh, in the event of herbivory, the animal is the clear winner. The animal gets food and the plant is the clear loser. The plant is what is losing resources or outright dying depending on how hungry that animal is. Now there are also defenses that plants put up in order to defend itself from herbivory similar to that evolutionary arms race of predators and prey. There is another evolutionary arms race between herbivores and plants and that can be things like toxic chemicals which uh, is something similar to nicotine in the tobacco plant which was actually an adaptation that tobacco plant acquired in order to uh, poison the insects that were living in it. Then we discovered that it was addictive and uh, used it for an entire other purpose. And then the other instance is going to be things like thorns and spines, something you might see in a rose bush, which can spear and kill insects which are trying to eat it, or deter a large herbivore from chopping down on that stem because it's really sharp and can hurt that herbivore. And then finally, when we look at uh, species interactions, we have the one beneficial uh, interaction that's going to be something called a mutualism. In mutualism, two or more species benefit from their interactions with one another. Each partner, in this case, provides a service uh, to the other, and so both organisms are going to benefit from this interaction. And this is an example of something called symbiosis, which is a relationship in which two organisms live in close physical contact uh, with one another. In a symbiosis could be referred to both a mutualism and uh, parasitism. However, uh, in the instance of mutualism, both organisms benefit, whereas in parasitism, one organism benefits and the other one is negatively affected. Now, examples of symbiosis are going to be things like mycorrhizal fungi, uh, basically where you have a fungus that lives in the roots of different plants and uh, helps those roots gain more nutrients, and in addition, taking advantage of some of the nutrient processing that those roots take, that those roots do themselves. So the roots get access to better nutrients and the, the fungus gets access to the processed nutrients of those roots, so both organisms benefit. Um, and then another another great example is that of zooxanthellae, a algae inside of coral, and coral reefs themselves. Corals aren't plants. Corals are actually a type of animal, and what they have embedded in them is a type of microscopic algae that photosynthesizes and produces sugars for the coral. In return, the um, the algae gets a home within the coral and those protective structures. So this is another example of both organisms actually benefiting. And then finally, pollination is probably the best example of a mutualism. In this case, the pollinator, an insect, maybe a bee, a wasp, or something else, gets the benefit of getting nectar or food from the plant, and the, the plant gets a free pollination service. It allows uh, the plant to transfer its genes and genetic information from one plant to the other to another in order to get genetically uh, variable uh, plants within that species. So these are all examples of mutualisms within 
uh, the animal kingdom. Now that is everything we have today for species interactions. I hope you guys thought this uh, lecture was cool. Next we'll be going over trophic uh, structure. We're going to be going over food webs, food chains, and apex predators. I'll see you guys then.